we'll continue our discussion on uh, KKT conditions today. I'm going to end the class early today because I need to go for the meeting. So let's continue our discussion on KKT conditions. I want to solve the following problem. I want to minimize x such that hx equals to 0 gx is less than equal to 0, h is a function from rn to rm, g is a function from rn to rr and everything is differentiable, everything is as nice and smooth as you want it to be and there is the definition of regular point. So, this is all the recap of what we did in the previous class. So, x is regular if gradient of h1 of x, gradient of hm of x, gradient of gj of x for all j that are active at x are linearly independent. Okay. The other thing that I did not cover in the previous class, so this is a new definition which is the definition of v at x first order feasible de first order feasible directions is the set of d such that gradient of h i x transpose d equals to 0 gradient of g j x transpose d equals to 0 for all j that are active. Okay. So, basically the, cons the inequality constraints that are active uh, in the definition of regularity and first order feasible directions you essentially assume them to be an active constraint which is these are not these constraints are not treated any differently from the equality constraint case um, you know just for the definition purpose. Okay. So, remember that g j of x is equal to 0 for all j that are active at x. And okay, so the gradients, uh, gradients are tantamount to normal vectors, is that correct? The gradient is normal to the constraints? <laughs> or the plane, plane spanned by constraints or yes. hyperplane spanned by these vectors. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so that's what the Lagrange okay. multiplier. So this is this is saying yeah. that um, the direction, the feasible directions are those that are actually in the plane spanned by the constraints. Uh, orthogonal to the plane spanned by the constraints. So the plane spanned by the constraints are. Okay. Let me draw a picture. Uh, this is my hx equals to 0, this is my gj of x equals to 0 yep. and this is the, the set at which I am trying to minimize my function, right. So, this is gj of x less than 0, 
and this is hx equal to 0. So essentially you want to minimize your function in this region but not in this region. So this is out of your feasible region. And the normal to the surface hx equal to 0 might be in this direction. So this is my gradient of hx at this point, at this x. And the gradient of gj, so at this point gj is active, okay? At this point gj is not active, right? Because gj of x is strictly less than 0. This is the gj of x equal to 0. So there's only one point at which the gj of x equal to 0 constraint is active. And at that point, the normal is essentially this, right? So they are linearly independent. And the gradient of f would lie in the plane that is spanned by the gradient of hx and the gradient of gj. So if it is a two-dimensional system, then the gradient of f could lie in any direction. But if it was a three-dimensional system, then it can only lie in the plane spanned by these two vectors. Okay, so this point is regular, and at these, these points, there is only one constraint, which is gradient of hx equal to 0. The other, the, the other constraint, gj of x, is not active because it's strictly less than 0. And so oh, for proving that x is regular, all you need to show is that the gradient of hx are linearly, I mean, if you have multiple hx, then gradient of each of those hi are linearly independent. Now, if, if, like, uh, if it is required that our feasible direction be perpendicular to that gradient, does that necessarily mean that it's parallel to the vectors that are inside the set defined by hx equal to zero? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's right. So first order feasible directions here would be this and this, yeah. right? Here, the first order feasible direction is actually empty. D equals zero is the only feasible direction because both the constraints are active. In R2, yes, of course, in R2, yeah. Okay, any question so far on the definition of regularity and first order feasible directions? Okay, so again, at this point where gj of x is not active, the first order feasible directions are going up and going down. At this point, the first order feasible direction is just zero. Okay, so there's no non-zero feasible direction at this point if you are in R2. Okay, so what's the KKD condition? So KKD condition says, oh, oh, let me construct the Lagrangian. So L is F plus lambda transpose H plus mu transpose G. Uh, let me show the dependence on X lambda and G. So L depends on X lambda and mu. And so the KKT theorem says X star optimal and regular implies there exist lambda star in Rm, mu star in Rr, such that gradient of x at L at the optimal point is equal to zero. The second is mu j star is greater than or equal to 0 for all j in 1 to r. Mu j star is equal to 0 if g j of x is x star is strictly less than 0. And the fourth condition is D transpose second derivative of L at the optimal point D is greater than or equal to zero for all D in V 
extra. Which we said before is often in order to be able to prove that the second degree is positive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One small comment here is that in many cases, these two conditions are combined by saying that mu j star g j x star is equal to 0. Okay. What does it imply? Either this is not either, but either both of them are 0 or one of them is equal to 0. So, if the constraint is active, so gj of x star is equal to 0, mu j star could be 0 or positive, that is this, this value. If gj of x star is strictly less than 0, then mu j star must be equal to 0. Okay, and of course, mu j star has to be non-negative. Um, yeah. Uh, does the kicking teeth theorem say if, that there will be unique the lambda uh, and mu because the implication there is that it's necessarily uh, You know, I have never seen a uniqueness result. Uh, but let me try to argue it from Lagrange multiplier theorem. So remember in Lagrange multiplier theorem, uh, lambda star was defined as limit k h x k star right so the limit cannot be you cannot have two separate limits so so let me let me make a claim that they are unique but i have never seen it written that they are unique um, but that's a very good question Okay, any other question? Yes. Yeah, so why is why should this be true? Let me give you a non rigorous proof. Okay, proof by example or proof by graphical methods. And I'm going to use sensitivity theorem for that. Okay. So, I want to delete something. So, the question is why should this be true? What is the intuition? So, sensitivity theorem says that mu j star would be equal to the derivative of j star over del u j where u j is my g j of x star, sorry not g j of, so in the new problem I change one constraint which is g j of x is less than or equal to u j and u j is a very small number, a small positive number. And there should be a negative sign here. Okay. Now, I'm going to consider the same example. So I have my h of x equal to zero. I have my g j of x equal to zero. And I need another color. This is g j of x equals to 0 0.01, okay? And this is the, sorry. This is the feasible region for the original problem. And this is the feasible region for the new problem. OK. 
okay I want you guys to stare at this diagram for a few seconds what's happening to the feasible region once I move the constraint in the positive direction yes it's larger okay so so Ma Matthew points out that initially the feasible region was smaller and as soon as I moved the constraint a little bit towards the positive side the feasible region became much larger okay not much but it became larger what does that imply for J star what happens to J star if so originally you were doing optimization over a small set and then you increase the size of the set okay the original set still lies within the larger set that you are considering what happens to the optimal value of the optimization problem sorry it should be smaller okay so uh, Mensis says that it should be smaller how many of you agree to her claim so she's saying that J star for this problem is going to be smaller than J star for this problem two people three people agree to it no, no. oh you don't agree to it it's going to be less than or equal to yeah less than equal to yeah, okay, okay. yeah. Yes, I agree. so let me call this J 0 0.01 star and J 0 star and her claim is that j 0 0.01 star is less than equal to j 0 star okay so i want all of you so first of all i want everyone to agree to this claim so how many of you don't agree to this claim how many of you agree to this claim okay so you expand the feasible region the value should be lower Yeah. yeah. J is a measure of right. So well, no, J is just the optimal value. Yeah. 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 So J star is the optimal value. What's the optimal value? Well, mu star, mu J star is given by this, evaluated at u J equals zero. So, so I start at u J equals zero. I change u J by a little bit. And I see that my J star would reduce, I mean, would be less than equal to. Okay. So what I see is that del J star is negative. Of course, del U J is positive, And then I have a negative sign. So that implies that mu J star has to be greater than equal to zero. Okay. Let me go let me start let me go through this argument again so I started with the optimization problem that hx is equal to 0 and gx is less than equal to 0 so that's this region this line below this uh, red curve then I said that I'm going to increase the value 0 I'm going to increase the value 0 to 0 0.01 so I'm essentially increasing uj a little bit and I get a new optimal value which is j star of 0 0.01 so j star is the minimum value of the function fx okay and the claim is since I'm expanding the set my optimal value must be less than equal to the optimal value of the previous situation and from sensitivity theorem I know that mu j star is equal to the negative of change of function over the change in the constraint and since u, del uj is positive del j star is negative or less than equal to zero so mu j star must be greater than equal to zero in, in particular if you if your optimal solution is here at which g j x star is strictly less than zero then moving this boundary 
by a little bit doesn't really change the optimal solution. And therefore, it doesn't change the optimal value. And therefore, mu j star must necessarily be equal to 0. And what you mean when you say that j is the minimum value, That's you don't mean that it's the input. You mean that it's actually the output of the function. Yes, fx star. Yeah. So x star is arg min and f of x star is j star. So optimal value means f of x star, optimal point means x star, okay, the arg min. necessarily if you're trying to optimize over a constraint region, your point that you said was optimal may or may not actually be you know, a global minimum. And so if you happen to expand your region mm -hmm. such that you add in a lower y value, if you right. will, then yeah, if we add that new region, your optimal value is going to get small. Yes. Yes. Questions? Yes. Yes, yes. So let me give you an intuition about how to prove this result using Lagrange multiplier theorem. So all I'm going to do is solve the following problem. I want to minimize x in Rn, z in Rr, f of x plus 0 such that h of x equal to 0 and gj of x plus zj square is equal to 0. Okay, so this is gj of x plus zj square is equal to 0. Okay, and this problem is equivalent to this problem. Okay, but you have increased the dimension of the problem, the optimization problem. And so the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to this would be lambda star, and corresponding to this would be mu star. And you can apply the Lagrange multiplier theorem for this particular problem and go through some simplifications in order to get rid of this GJ, ZJ term and you get these results. Okay, so the sensitivity theorem still holds. Question? You know, that's a pathological condition. I don't quite know what happens because none of the books cover it. <laughs> you can certainly po find an optimal solution. The problem is the existing theory doesn't really help you in finding the optimal solution. Okay. Yes, that's right. That's right. But the problem is where do you exactly encounter non-regular sets. I, I have never seen a non-regular sets in my life. But that's because my lifespan has been very small. <laughs> 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 if I had lived for a thousand years, maybe I would have seen a real problem where you have non-regular sets. Yes. Yes, I think 
Yes, so his point, Matthew's point is that the, the argument about regularity only appears in Lagrange multiplier theorem. So everything before this, whatever we have studied for constraint optimization doesn't really require regularity. Regularity again came up in simplex manifold optimization, manifold sub-optimization method, right? So if you leave aside that method, we didn't really encounter regularity anywhere else. And so his point is that if you have a non-regular set, you might be able to use one of those results which requires convexity of the constraint set. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so let's see how we can use this KKT theorem to solve problems. I'm going to erase this side of the board. So I want to minimize half of x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square such that x1 plus x2 plus x3 is less than equal to negative 3. My Lagrangian is, so step one, is this set regular, right? Take the derivative, it's always one, 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 so it's regular. So I'm not even going to worry about step zero, which is making sure that no matter where x star is, the set is going to be regular. So I don't even want to worry about it. So my the Lagrangian is x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square plus mu x1 plus x2 plus x3 minus 3. Okay, there is no lambda here because there is no equality constraint. What's the derivative? So I want to take the derivative of Lagrangian with respect to x. x1 plus mu, x2 plus mu, x3 plus mu. Okay, so this implies that my x1 star will be equal to negative mu star, x2 star will be equal to negative mu star, and x3 star will be negative mu star. Yes? No, so okay, mu is a scalar here because you only have one inequality constraint. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Well, not active, just number of inequalities. So mu star is in RR, lambda star is in RM. M is the number of equalities and R is the number of inequalities. Okay. Now, remember in equality constraint in step two, if it were an equality constraint, I'll just take hx star equal to zero, find out the value of mu star and enjoy my rest of the life, okay? But now we have an inequality constraint, so what do we do? Okay, so when problem is of inequality constraint, then we need to be a bit careful. Okay. 
why is it minus 3 here? Oh, it should be plus 3. Right. Good. So there should be a plus 3 here. Okay, please check this. Fine. Okay, so now in step 2, what do we do? So first, I'm going to claim that x1 star plus x2 star plus x3 star is strictly less than minus 3 is strictly less than minus 3 which would imply that mu star is equal to 0 which would imply that x1 star plus x2 star plus x3 star is equal to 0 so it's a contradiction which means that this is not true okay so this condition this hypothesis not true okay so step 2 is, is is a little bit more complicated yes so how does that logic this third this third statement okay so if gj x star is strictly less than 0 so in this case there is only one g so g x star is strictly less than 0 then mu star necessarily has to be 0 so mu star should be equal to 0 and that would imply that x that would imply that if I sum these three terms then it should be equal to 0 so that is not the case by assumption therefore there is a contradiction and it means that the sum of these three terms cannot be strictly less than negative 3. Uh, no actually remember that gj gj is so the original constraint is gj x is less than equal to 0 so if you want to see gj that would be equal to plus 3 plus 3 less than equal to 0 second port right okay perfect. sorry yeah okay so now let's tackle the other case where we have an equality in which case mu star can be anything well anything positive or zero so I'm going to assume that x1 star plus x2 star plus x3 star equals to negative 3 in which case I have negative 3 mu star equals to negative 3 this implies mu star is equal to 1 and then I can use this fact here to imply that x1 star equals to x2 star equals to x3 star is equal to negative 1. So remember that x1 star is equal to negative mu star, x2 star is negative mu star, x3 star is negative mu star, so that's why I get this. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, see what I'm doing is I'm treating the GJX as an active constraint here, right? And then everything is just the same as Lagrange multiplier. There's no difference. So, once I make it an active constraint, then uh, 
I just plug in the value of x star from step 1 here to get the value of mu star, then plug it back in step 1 to get the value of x star. I have never encountered it, but I could probably come up with a pathological example here to get a bogus answer. You get contradiction in both situations. Yeah, like for some reason, yeah. Right. Yeah. Or somehow what we did wrong. Like yeah. 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 I've never encountered it. Again, partly because of my age. <laughs> Yes. If you're not going to pick up one up over the weekend for these. No. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh -huh. Exam should be simple. It should be easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. To, to, to that point, homework three was supposed to be the most difficult homework uh, because I wanted to... I wanted to show you guys what it takes to go from theory to practice in MATLAB. Uh, now onwards, all the homeworks are going to be theory questions, okay? Um, so it's going to be much easier. So you have to think more and work less, okay? Write less. But uh, we went from use linear programs um, to write it to the end of Right. Right. Yes, but remember that I can bet 50% of the people in this class will be writing software for the next 10 years. Optimization software, optimization routine. So they will be implementing algorithms like this on their day-to-day -day job. Okay? That's what people at Lyft do most of the time, that's what people at Uber do, that's what people at Amazon do. And all sorts of industries on a day-to-day -day basis, especially those who go into technical groups. Some of them might be intelligent and they would go for MBA, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and then they won't ever have to write a code like assignment three, okay? All right, so any, any question? <laughs> Sorry? It's now that we're all on the same page. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes. That's right. So when you have, let's say I had two constraints here, then you will have to have four steps, four sub-steps within step two. So first constraint is inactive, second constraint is inactive, both are inactive and both are active. And then you will get corresponding contradictions or optimal solutions for each case. And yeah, it becomes very difficult. There's a combinatorial blow up when you have n number of inequality constraints. So, uh, would we ever wind up with uh, multiple solutions that didn't imply uh, contradictions and then we just have to exhaustively check right. which one's minimal? Right. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything we could do for like strength of constraints for seeing if one constraint rules out other answers? So, which means you might have redundant constraints, okay. right? So then. So if we have non-redundant constraints, we yeah. have to exhaustively exempt. Right. Them. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, so the next few classes, we are going to talk about how to use this whole Lagrange multiplier theorem and KKD theorem ideas to solve constraint optimization problems of this type. Okay, and. There are two essential methods for solving problems of this type, which is something that you have already encountered. So one is I penalize within the optimization algorithm, I am going to penalize violating the constraint. Okay, that's idea number one. The idea number two is I am going to create a barrier around these inequality constraints so that as soon as you go 
as soon as you tend to violate this constraint your cost function goes to infinity okay so let me tell you by picture what exactly is it that we are doing so barrier method i want to minimize a function between 0 and 1 just uh, something like this yeah and so now i want to minimize a function between 0 and 1 and the problem is if i run an algorithm uh if i run the unconstrained optimization algorithm starting from some point here i might just go out of the set so i need to somehow discourage the algorithm from going out of the set and since we are doing minimization i'm going to add a function that goes to infinity closer to 0 and then goes to infinity closer to 1 so i'm going to add this function to this particular objective function so this is my f of x and this function would be b of x which is barrier function so i'm going to add a barrier much like you do fencing in your garden right so you add a fence but it's not a 6 feet fence okay in, in columbus you can only have 6 feet fence this fence goes all the way to plus infinity okay all the way to space <laughs> so you want to create a fence and then you add these two this function plus the barrier function to get something that looks like like this and so then you run an your unconstrained optimization problem within this region and since you're always descending you will end up converging here or you will end up converging here Yes, yes. So you have to so you will add so you will add fx plus epsilon bx where epsilon is a tunable parameter and you will keep reducing the value of epsilon at every step. So what you end up doing is you have this big optimization problem you transform it into a sequence of smaller sub optimization problems which if you solve you converge to the optimal point. Okay, so that's the barrier method. Yes. That's right. That's right. We will we will talk about it in case of linear programming. What does barrier method try to do? Okay. So when you have an optimal solution at the at the edge, right? So either at this point or at this point. what happens with this barrier method is you get as close to zero let's say zero is the optimal solution you get as close to zero as possible but you never quite hit zero because at zero the barrier always is equal to infinity so no matter what the value of function is your objective function blows up so most of the provably fast method for linear programming actually comes from the barrier method so the solution you get is in linear programming the solution there will always be a solution at the boundary but you will never quite get to the boundary but you can get arbitrarily close to the boundary okay and so what you get is an approximately optimal solution not the optimal solution but the difference the error is of the order of 10 raised to minus 15 so it's kind of not important the other class of algorithms is called augmented lagrangian methods where you tend to solve the problem by minimizing lc of x comma lambda which is fx plus lambda transpose hx plus c over 2 norm of hx square 
okay and this is minimum over x this is this is only for equality constraints uh, we'll talk about how to manage equality and inequality constraints when we talk about these methods okay so this is for equality constraint this is for inequality constraint and so in inequality constraint you create a barrier as soon as you are going to get closer to the boundary in the equality constraint you add a high penalty for violating the constraint right remember you want hx equal to 0 so if your hx is non zero and your c is whatever 10 raised to 5 then you add a huge penalty for violating the constraint so this is known as the penalty method Okay, and within penalty method, there are a lot of sub methods which allows you to tune lambda so that you get to the solution faster. It's just arbitrarily close. So I'm saying that within machine precision, okay, you can get close to the solution. Now, if your original solution was one million, then 10 raised to negative 15 is really a very small number. If your solution is 1 or 1, 0.1, then 10 raised to 15 is not as minuscule. I mean, it's still minuscule, but not in comparison to if the solution was 1 million. It's all about machine precision. Uh -huh. And in, uh, frankly, in many cases, you don't really care whether you are at the optimal or not. As long as you are close to the optimal, you are happy. right? Just like you were happy when your algorithm Manifolds of optimization algorithm gave a solution that's reasonably close to the optimal solution. You are happy, right? So it's pretty much the same thing in most industries. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, uh, the other thing that I want to mention here is, now that we are talking about what's reasonable and what's unreasonable, in many situations, for instance, in electricity market, when you say close to the optimal, let's say with you are within 1% of the optimal, that 1% essentially means billions of dollars over a year. Okay, So if you come up with a better algorithm to solve their problem, which, which comes to the accurate or which comes close to the optimal solution uh, of the order of 0.9%, you are essentially saving hundreds of millions of dollars every year. Okay, So do keep in mind that I'm saying reasonably close me, doesn't mean that you should feel happy about it because there are situations where even making an improvement of 0.1% makes a huge difference in the operational cost. So keep that in mind when you are looking for jobs. Um, okay. So I'm going to what I'm going to do next is I'm going to talk about barrier method and how to use barrier method for linear programming. Uh, and then we'll talk about augmented Lagrangian method of multipliers and so on, which uses penalty method to solve uh, optimization problems. Okay, any questions? Okay, the quiz is on Monday, one page cheat sheet, both sides. And if the baby is not out, I'll be here. If the baby is out, I won't be here. Okay, somebody else will be here. All right, thank you guys. Have a good weekend.